um, Senator Amosu as well here, and of course, uh, Okoyemi Bamidili and uh, Senator Jibola Bashir. Thank you very much for being here as well. The President of the Court of Appeal and Justices of the Supreme Court, Honorable Justice Dangban Mensem, uh, represented by Honorable Justice Daniel Khalil, GCA. Thank you for being here as well. The Ministers of Cabinet, rank of the Federal Republic of Kajia, I've been told that uh, we are really pressed for time. The Ambassadors of Foreign Nations, we'd like to welcome Ambassador George Ogunta, the Justice of the Supreme Court, retired. Uh, former ambassador to the United Kingdom. We have as well uh, present with us the justices of the Court of Appeal and also we have the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, Honorable Justice John Soho, represented by Honorable Justice Anna Kay. Uh, the justices of the Federal, various Supreme Courts, thank you very much as well. We have our royal fathers also in our midst, His Royal Majesty Oba Alayulua Sahid Alegushi. Thank you, sir, as well. And of course, the Oba uh, Lawal, that's the Oniru of Iru. We have the, we have the chairman of uh, Parastatals, the head of service of Lagos, so Mr. Hakim Muriokwala, the SANs present, members of the legal profession, and of course, uh, heads of states, and of course, the group MDs and the statesmen, the captains of industries, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, those of you viewing from home as well. I am standing on all existing protocols, and uh, during the course of this event, uh, we will acknowledge you on the multimedia screen as you arrive. So thank you very much for being here, and we formally welcome you. This event is one to celebrate um, Chief Wale Olani Pekun, OFR, SEN, uh, 45 years of legal practice. And the reason that we're all here, you'll get to understand a bit better. I would like to call on at this point um, a managing partner to continue with the proceedings of this event uh, in the person of Body Olani Peko, S A N. Mr. Vice President, sir, I'll stand on the ex existing protocols. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the second edition of the WOC Justice Summit. This summit is an initiative of Wally Olani Peko and Co and it's part of our contributions to support justice delivery in Nigeria. Our firm was established in 1980 by the then little known 29-year-old Mr. Wale Olanekwekun, who today is the 70-year-old chief Wale Olanekwekun, OFR, SAN, LLD, Doctor of Letters, FNILS, etc. <laughs> As a 41-year-old institution, we've interacted and engaged consistently with all sectors of law enforcement, including all strata of inferior trial and appellate courts in Nigeria. As at the end of 2020-2021 legal year, our firm had serviced legal obligations from 31 out of the 36 states of Nigeria, and also the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. Thus, we have been privileged to experience the good, very good, excellent, emulative, and not so good aspects of our justice delivery system. We therefore initiated the Justice Summit as a platform for critical engagements, where remarkable thought leaders of distinguished pedigree lead discussions that enhance justice delivery in Nigeria. A law firm is an institution that is underpinned by the core values of diligence, integrity, and refined expertise, because we believe that no value that is antithetical to these can be sustainable. Therefore, we're very deliberate in selecting speakers at the Justice Summit 
to ensure that the project can subscribe to the noble standards that Nigeria can aspire to for regeneration. Last year, we had Professor Yemi Oshibajo, Professor Fidelis Odita, Queen's Council, SAN, Yemi Kandit Johnson, SAN, Bree Steven Orr, QC, Boma Labi, SAN, and Professor Patu Tomi, who discussed the subject of developing an institutional concept of justice. This year, of course, parades a larger array of distinguished thought leaders, and the conversation majors on the practical. So significantly, we're, we're moving from the theoretical to the practical. Um, it's our pleasure today that we have a retired justice of the Supreme Court and the serving chief judge of Niger chief judge of Bono State that will speak on different aspects of the topic of integrity. This summit, of course, coincides with the 70th birthday of our founder, Chief Wali Olanikwe Kunesen, a venerated Nigerian hero and champion. It represents to us the limitless capacity that God has endowed mankind with to set unimaginable positive records and consistently break those records with new, astounding, and astonishing records. Chief Olani Kwekun, sir. At Wali Olani Kwekun and Co, we're very proud to be worthy successors to the legacies you have already, you're laying, and you will still lay. Adela mentioned that we're deliberating our choice of speakers, or our choices of speakers, at this summit. It is therefore no coincidence that the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria was a speaker at last year's summit, and is also chairing this event. Mr. Vice President, sir. In our view, you are a phenomenal Nigerian, and your capacity to ideate is reminiscent of philosophers with global acclaim. We note that your intelligence is that which is typical of rare geniuses, and that your equipment to execute judicial and public sector reforms are not only proven, but they are manifest as well as remarkable. It is therefore my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to invite His Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, Grand Commander of the Order of the Niger and Senior Advocate of Nigeria to give his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you very much. Please sit. Thank you. Bode, thank you very much for that very kind and generous introduction. If I don't, uh, I'd better just make sense here after that kind of uh, very glowing introduction. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, represented today by the Honorable Kuye Adamori Aliu, the Chief Justice of Nigeria, ably represented by Honorable Justice Olukwayode Ariwola. Excellency the Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Sonwolu, the Deputy Chief of Staff to the President, Mr. Adeolai Kwaye, our host and honorary Chief Wale Olani Kwekun, OFR, Senior Advocate, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and his dear wife, Mrs. Erelu Ashiwaju Omolara Olani Kwekun. Fabo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, the President of the Court of Appeal, represented today by the Honorable Justice Daniel Kalio. The panel of discussants, His Royal Majesty the Honorable Justice Ferdode Tobai, retired, the Honorable Justice Paul Galunje, retired, the Honorable Justice Kashim Zana, the Chief Judge of Bono State, Mr. A.B. Mahmoud, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Mrs. Funke Adekoya, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Femi Falano, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and Mrs. Ibukunwa Woshika, the matriarch of the Nigerian Bar and the very first female Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Chief Folake Sholake, C.O.N.S.A.M. 
honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me uh, say how deeply honored I am to have been asked to chair uh, this symposium of uh, the WOC Justice Summit 2.0 in celebration of the 70th birthday of my dear Ebon, Chief Wale Olanikweku, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Uh, if you look at Chief Olanikweku's photographs uh, when he was 40, when he was 50 and 60 and now 70, it is evident that nothing has changed. He looks exactly the same. Although I hear some troublemakers saying that it's his bank accounts you should look at for any changes. <laughs> well, let me uh, speak for my bond on that. Uh, let us just say that his finances have grown from strength to strength and from glory to glory. I've advised that he needs to spend some of that hard currency now. I suggested that he might buy a jet. It will make his journeys all across the country and elsewhere more pleasurable. And not a big jet, Egmont, not a big one, just a small one, lest those naysayers accuse you of showing off. So we're just a little, just a little jet. But we thank God for giving him such sound physical and mental health and an ever youthful physique and disposition. Many years ago, I said to Chief Olani Kwekun that he is becoming Nigeria's most consequential constitutional lawyer since the legendary Rotimi Williams, senior advocate of Nigeria, of blessed memory, going by the number and range of constitutional matters in our superior courts in which he acted as counsel. I now know that I might have understated what his relevance would be, because clearly, given the number and variety of the major cases that he has been in, and many of which he has won, he is probably one of the most consequential and influential lawyers in the Commonwealth. <laughs> Chief Olani Kwekun's great intellect, his mastery of the law, its substance, its technicalities, his incredible ability to get to the heart of the matter and to let whole panels of judges see his sometimes daring points, his disarming wit and humor, and his sometimes lyrical and poetic submissions, quoting from the classics and the scriptures, make him easily one of the most outstanding minds in the legal profession in this or any other generation. But I'm sure that what must give him as much, if not more, satisfaction as his accomplishments in the legal profession is how he has affected the lives of hundreds and maybe thousands who cannot repay him for his kindness, his many charities and philanthropies, and several contributions to the growth and reach, especially of the gospel. I'm especially thankful to God uh, that the tributes that you are being paid today are not being said at a memorial service, or as we say, a celebration of life, as we call it, when you are gone, but in your lifetime. There's simply nothing comparable to seeing your legacy in your lifetime. A father of four lawyers, Dakbo, Bukola, Bode, and Dimitokwe, two senior advocates of Nigeria. Dakbo and Bode, and the elder senior advocate, Dakbo, even went as far as a doctorate in law. But I'm sure Chief Olani Kwekun will agree that the very best partnership is probably not Wale Olani Kwekun and Co. It is with his sweetheart of many years, and the mother of his children, Erelu Ashiwaju Omolara Olani Kwekun. Our dear auntie, who's without, who, whose uh, unfailing love and support, he undoubtedly would have been far less successful. I've had many conversations with Chief Olani Kwekun through the years, and invariably we come back to the elephant in the room. Will the legal profession as we know it survive another 50 years, given the gridlock in processing cases through the courts and the question of integrity of the legal process, or better still, the integrity of the actors in the legal process? Regarding delays in Nigerian courts, 
the UK Court of Appeal, the United Kingdom Court of Appeal, had occasion to comment in the case of IPCO and NMPC in 2015, where a challenge to the enforcement of a Nigerian seated arbitration tribunal award came before the English Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal referred to the delays in the parallel proceedings in a Nigerian court as catastrophic and that it will take a further 30 years to resolve. Incidentally, the expert witness who testified on the delays in the Nigerian courts was a former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Nigeria who testified that it will take 20 to 30 years to resolve a case in the Nigerian court. On the integrity of the legal process and its key actors, judges and lawyers, most of us know most of us who are here and who have practiced in our courts and who still practice in our courts know at least anecdotally that many important cases today are under a shroud of doubt as to whether the outcomes would be influenced one way or the other. I look forward to the conversations with that we focus on the implementable ideas, not a rehash of the problems, as we are all experts at the problem already. So let me again congratulate my boy on his 70th birthday and to remind him that his best years are still ahead of him. And as the scripture says, the path of the just are like the shining sun, a shine ever brighter unto the perfect day. And so it shall be with you in Jesus' mighty name. May I therefore welcome all of you to this event and wish you a very enjoyable afternoon. Thank you. I couldn't help but take away from the speech for some reason I just had bank account and uh, on behalf of the Federal Republic of Nigeria I'd like you all to check your mobile phones your last bank account details and in exactly two minutes it will still remain the same bank account details but hard work and perseverance is a quality that not only the Vice President shares, but of course, um, the man that we are celebrating today. And um, on that note, I would want to proceed to give the podium for the opening remarks and the goodwill messages all tied up into one. And to call on is a Chief Justice of Nigeria, the Honorable Justice Ibrahim Tanko Mohammed CFR, to give the first goodwill message this afternoon. Please do make welcome the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Honorable Justice Ibrahim Tanko Mohammed. It, it's okay to clap. <laughs> Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Shibajo, SANGCO. This is the goodwill message by the Honorable the Chief Justice of Nigeria, who would have loved to be physically present to give this goodwill message. But as we are all aware, the All Nigerian Judges Conference is taking place and is closing today. But because I wear two caps to be physically present, personally, and now here and now to represent His Lordship, the Chief Justice of Nigeria, to celebrate our brother and friend, Chief Wale Olani Pekun. 
That is why I have the honor and the privilege to deliver the goodwill message of the Chief Justice. It gives a great honor to be accorded the privilege of standing before eminent personalities from all walks of life to give a goodwill message to a legal giant of the act of Chief Wale Olanikwekun, S.A.N. on the epochal occasion of his 70th birthday anniversary. Today is not only a memorable day in his life alone, but the lives of the several people across the country and beyond that he has positively impacted on. Great men like this naturally have their tentacles widely spread across the arts of an unimaginable generations of beneficiaries of his magnanimous disposition. To that effect, I want to use this opportunity to enjoin all of us to always be mindful of the fact that there is a tide in the affairs of men. The works of our hands shall always rise stoutly in testimony on our behalf when we are gone. It is with a heart full of joy that I join everyone here in celebrating this amiable legal icon, Chief Wale Olanipekun, S.A.N., who has been bestriding the Nigerian legal landscape with iconic academic discernment, is one lawyer that has lasted on our memory an enviable degree of intellectual eminence and legal finance that encompasses all spheres of philosophy and methodical reasoning. My learned friend and brother, Chief Wale Olani Pekun, is a very unique and nationalistic Nigerian with the radical posture of justice and rule of law. And he pursues every case he handles to a logical and reasonable conclusion. Even though he looks simple and unassuming, is very strict and consciously principled in this position. He is always very warm and engaging, which underscores the litany of friends and admirers that are always milling around him. Like all great men, my learned brother is a man of paradox, simple without being simplistic in this position, elitist and dignified in courage, yet he relates exceptionally well with the downtrodden, as his entire life is completely devoid of publicity, undue arrogance and elitism. That, indeed, is a direct reflection of his life, his personality, his environment, and his upbringing. The Chief Wale Olani Pekun that I have known and related closely with for several years has been a dogged fighter for whatever cause he believes in. Yet, an astute advocate of the arts of mediation and reconciliation, little wonder is fondly called the Prince of Peace by his colleagues and teaming admirers. Those who know him very well will harbor no doubt of his expansive landscape of courage that does not hurt or intimidate others. He epitomizes the generosity that does not vaunt, and even showed a loving kindness for people that have arisen triumphant over his human frailties. Like the proverbial mountain of refuge, he willingly offered this enamored curtain of cloud as shield over his clan of friends and acquaintances. He's a man with a heart large enough to accommodate people from all walks of life. He has become a refuge of some sort to a large clan of followers who continually draw inspiration, succor, and strength to propel their foray into the wild world. Our birthday boy has always exhibited scholarship and legal candor. Every of his presentations in the courtroom is laced with academic flavor and intellectual steam. His oratory prowess is like an ocean wave that moves with vigor 
and vibrancy. Its legal presentations have covered a gamut of issues that have offered us sufficient food for thought, not just as judicial officers and lawyers, but as citizens of the global community that are desirous of having a free, peaceful, and egalitarian society. His intellectual accomplishments have, to a large extent, crystallized the legal profession by injecting confidence in the minds of both practitioners and law students. His astuteness and eloquence in the courtroom, coupled with the seamless application of legal wisdom to any cause he's championing, has made him an enigma of some sort. A quintessential role model to several people, is literally a man of many paths. Is an industry, deep knowledge of law and meteoric execution of all cases brought to him by his large clientele community have stood him out as a man of honor and uncommon pedigree. It is these rare qualities that enhance his meteoric accession to the inner bar. As a reliable acquaintance that I have been closely related with for several years, Chivwale Olanipekunwe SCN is by all standards a rare gem and unblemished specimen of trust and integrity. He has been gallantly treading many paths exclusively preserved for people of honor. For those who are fortunate to encounter him at both formal and informal levels, he has always willingly offered them is cool in humility and integrity. In everything he does, he endeavors to leave an indelible mark that displays the banner of a man of substance and dignity. He has worked assiduously to etch his name in gold as a minister in the temple of justice. And as ipso facto, won an army of admirers to himself through his enviable mastery of law. Interestingly, that has consciously brought us to the enviable conclusion that the celebrant has proved that most things that certain people do exceptionally well are proofs of their ability to identify their talents. It is the general belief, however, that anyone who excels in the practice of his chosen profession is not necessarily as a result of age or dogged perseverance on the job, but the simple exhibition of the talent endowed him by the Almighty God. My Lords, Your Excellency, My Lord Justice Nene Abayete of Amagacha of the Supreme Court of Ghana, who we expect to give the short why and taking through the webs and tapestry of the subject that reclines on implementing justice sector reforms has a remarkable affinity with professionalism and excellence. I can confidently fight for his lordship's capacity to convey us through this professional cum academic voyage with a touch of excellence that he deserves. Once again, Your Excellency, I wish my learned brother Happy birthday, more prosperous years ahead, graceful aging, and God's protection all through his sojourn on heart. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sure for those of us in the hall, we have attended numerous events of such where you hear the word goodwill messages. Uh, traditionally, goodwill messages have two major qualities that they display, which is uh, kindness and friendliness. And I'm sure those two qualities are in excess in this room. Uh, on that note, just to break the ice a bit, just turn to the person to your right with a little knuckle and say, hope you're doing fine. It's as simple as that. Still in the spirit of goodwill messages, I would like to call on the President of Court of Appeal, Honorable Justice Monica Donba Mensem, PCA, for her, for his goodwill message. A round of applause, please.
So let me not mangle the protocols. I'll just stand on the protocols established by the Master of Ceremonies. <clears throat> I'm here to deliver a goodwill message on behalf of the President of the Court of Appeal, Honorable Justice Monica Bongan Tongan Menson. I'll go straight to the message that she has for the celebrants, Chief Alani Peko. I thank the Almighty God for giving me the privilege of delivering the remarks in honor of a respected lawyer and former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Chief Wale Olani Pekun, Officer of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, SAN. I'm also pleased to, to be part of the second edition of the annual Wale Olani Pekun and Co Justice Summit. The importance of the guests at an event is a pointer to the importance of the honoree. The presence of the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Osinvajo, GCUN, SAN, no doubt underscores Chief Wale Olani Pekun's importance to the legal profession and the nation. Chief Wale Olani Pekun is a giant of the bar. Without wanting to conjure up the image of a biblical Goliath, the Nenel Silk is one of the most recognizable legal practitioners at the Nigerian bar. His footprints have also been indelible in the development of our jurisprudence for, for, for 45 years. However, as with all things, the Holy Bible instructs, instructs us never to despise humble beginnings, and we know that the chief began life humbly. Chief Wale Olani Kwekun is a native of Ikere Ikiti, a town steeped in great tradition of producing eminent jurists such as Honorable Justice M.E. Ugundari, J.S.C., of less memory, and notable lawyers such as the late Chief Albert Oju Akonli, S.A.N. No doubt he's a, tie, or he's a true equity man, and Omoluabi. Chief Olani Kwekun obtained his West African school certificate at Elisha Grammar School before proceeding to the University of Lagos, Unilag where he obtained a bachelor's degree in law. Following the obligatory stint at the Nigerian Law School, Lagos, the chief was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1976. I shall not dwell on the antecedents of the man, but examine some of the character that he brought to, to the bar. He is noted to, as having been a student activist who acted the military regime in the 1970s, thus earning himself and hardy students a reputation. I'm sure that this dogged nature and sense of responsibility followed him into the bar and has helped establish him as a lawyer to watch. A character that has exemplified Chief Olani Pekun throughout his career has been his exactitude in the exposition of the law. A master of the intricacies of the law. I'm sure that the sight of the chief often makes many lawyers to cower, especially the, especially if they were ill-prepared for the legal tussle ahead. This, I'm sure, is because Chief Olani Pekun has always rigorously prepared for any matter he handled. It is an attribute that is admirable and one that I often counsel legal practitioners to imbibe at all times. Chief Olani Pekun has always been dutiful. As a result of his excellent brilliance, Chief Olay Olani Pekun became a senior advocate of Nigeria in 1991 aged 39 years, the youngest in his confirmation year. In the same year, he was appointed as the Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice of the old Undo State and served meritoriously in that capacity for two years. In 2002, he was elected as the 20th President of the Nigerian Bar Association. In 2003, he was appointed as the Vice President of the Pan-African Lawyers Union. In January 2007, Chief Olani Pekun became a life venture of the body of ventures. He has served as a member of the Legal Practitioners Privileges Committee, Council of Legal Education, General Council of the Bar, 
and Legal Practitioners Disciplinary Committee. Chief Olani Kwekun has also served on the Council of both the International Bar Association and the Commonwealth Lawyers Association for the reform of legal profession in Nigeria. And in an exemplary manner. Over the last three decades, Chief Ogwali Onadi Kwekun has been involved as involved as lead counsel in many high has been sorry has been involved as lead counsel in many high profile cases across various sectors of the Nigerian economy as well as landmark constitutional and statutory enforcement cases including acting as lead counsel to three presidents of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies and Chartered Institute of Arbitrators he has also been invited by the Supreme Court of Nigeria as amicus curiae in respect of intricate interpretations of the law. Graciously, the Leonard Silk has always risen to the call and provided sound counsel to the courts. Chief Olani Kwasun also possesses a love for education. He was the pro-chancellor and chairman of the governing council of the University of Ibadan between 2004 and 2006. In a commendable sense of duty as pro-chancellor and chairman of council of that university, he never collected his statutory allowances, which ran into millions of naira. Rather, he directed that money to, to give scholarships to students of the faculties of law, medicine, and computer science. In addition, the chief also donated 350 capacity lecture theaters to the University of, of Ibadan, as well as 10 million naira to, to, to mitigate the effect of flood at that university. Shows you the kind of person that Chief Olani Kwekun is. This is the sense of service one admires above him. Service to country, service to humanity. As the Pro-Chancellor and Chairman of the Governing Council of the Ajayi Kauda University, Oyo, he inaugurated a befitting quarters for the Vice-Chancellor of the University. He also served as a member of the Governing Council of the University of Adoikiti, Ekiti State, also making impact there. Despite the obvious successes and trappings of wealth, the chief remains humble and extremely polite to the bench and to his colleagues and everyone else. Chief Olani Peko remains a generous barman, sponsoring many young lawyers to the law school and carrying out many projects for the bar and his faith. He recently donated an ultra-modern cathedral to the Church of Christ, sorry, of the Church of God, to the Church of Nigeria, Anglican Communion in his hometown, and are similarly gifted befitting edifices to the Ikeri branch of the Nigerian Bar Association. Some would say that Chief Alani Kwekun is a role model, and who can disagree? His record speaks for itself, and his reputation as a great mind is undoubted. The foremost American preacher, and I conclude, William Ellery Channing, noted about 200 years ago that, and I quote, great minds are to make others great. Their superiority is to be used not to break the multitude to intellectual vas vassalage, not to, not to establish over them a spiritual tyranny, but to, rouse, but to rouse them from lethargy and to aid them to judge for themselves." Unquote. This is a habit that the chief has cultivated in his own children, two of whom are senior advocates of Nigeria, a feat in itself. I congratulate Chief Ole Onandi Pekun for his laudable life, and which he has, be, which he has bequeathed to, his, to the profession and the nation. As we begin this summit, I have only one wish for him, and that is that he will celebrate many more years in soundness of health and in mind. I also wish the Leonard Stokes, an officer of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, more success and greater accolades. I thank you for this honor given to me, and I wish us all a wonderful summit. May God bless us and the legal profession and the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you very much, sir. We have um, a quick word from the governor of Lagos State and the person of uh, Babajide Sonwolo. Please do make welcome. Uh, he's the governor of the state where, of course, uh, Chief obtained his bachelor's degree in law. And this is the only state that could have happened. Your Excellency, the 
Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Emi Oshibajo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Permit me, because of time, and the very many distinguished Nigerians that are here, to just rest on their existing protocols, and of course, to acknowledge my bon, um, the man we're all here to celebrate today, Chief Wale Olani Pekun, and his amiable wife. It's indeed a great honor to join in the celebration of an erudite scholar, a passionate professional, and indeed one of the brightest minds that has contributed to the growth and development of the Nigerian justice sector, Chief Wale Olani Pekun, OFR, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, LLD, on this occasion of his platinum jubilee. He is indeed a detribalized Nigerian. And like Bodhi had said, I'm sure there are no many law firms that can lay claim to having worked in over 31 of the 36 states in this country. It is a time to reflect and to celebrate your good health, as been said by Mr. Vice President. Great accomplishment, which is why you have a lot of people here today, and many blessings you are still enjoying on behalf of the good people and government of Lagos State. We rejoice with you, sir, Chief Wally Olan Peku, as you mark your platinum jubilee. It is an outstanding manner through which we are all here today to celebrate the Wale Olani Pekun and Co. Justice Summit 2.0. Your many contributions to the legal jurisprudence are numerous and outstanding as this could be charged to the many cases you have handled and you have won. One of the captivating of all is when you became a senior advocate of Nigeria at a young age of 39 and was subsequently appointed as the Attorney General of the old Ondo State in 1991, which record shows that you served meritoriously in that capacity. Due to your tenacity and passion, you were elected almost 20 years ago as the President of the Nigerian Bar Association in 2002, and you're still the lead counsel in many high-profile cases across various sectors in our country. As a man beyond comprehension, you devoted all your statutory allowance, as my last speaker to accept, as pro chancellor and chairman governing council of the University of Ibadan, to be given a scholarship to indigent students in various faculties and other projects. Sir, you are worthy of emulation, and it is our prayer that your inendible mark will live beyond you. We're here to thank God that it's not a celebration of life, like the Vice President said. It's a celebration in your time, and to see your many friends and family come out to truly celebrate you. This summit, which is the second in series, I believe, is in recognition of your intellectual contribution, which has created an avenue through which stakeholders can engage and prefer solutions to enhance the justice delivery system in Nigeria. I therefore urge all present to deliberate and to come up with steps to strengthen, to improve, and to build a lasting, adaptable justice delivery mechanism that we all hope to see. Once again, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the people and government of Lagos State, I wish you the very best as you start another journey that I know that life begins at 70 now and many more beautiful years ahead. It's our prayer that you will live long to celebrate many wins and successes that will impact our country. And on a personal note, I want to put on record that you are one of my very impartial and undiluted advisor. I want to thank you very much, sir. I want to publicly acknowledge that you have called me in the dead of the night to say, Mr. Governor, you need to change this. You need to look at this. You need to ask for this. And each time, I'm indeed very grateful that you can indeed do that for me. For a lot of people, on a personal note, 
Uncle Wale Olani Peku dresses impeccable. He had bought me three suits, and which I am indeed very grateful. But he still owes me one, because I did ask that body should also be given to us so that we can indeed make sure that it's all around that. And he knows what I'm talking about. The civic guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Governor. Before the panel discussion, um, we have our keynote address this afternoon. Um, Mr. Governor, um, I'm a size 58, just in case. No, I want to start with you, sir. We have um, the immediate past Vice Chancellor, Lagos State University, and of course, uh, an awardee of the National Order of Merit. And he's a great honor to have him here with us to deliver the keynote address on the theme of the summit, implementing justice sector reforms. Ladies and gentlemen, please do make welcome. Professor Larry Waju Fagbo, S-A-N. I've just been informed by the organizers that the keynote address has been bound in blue and is on the table beside the guests. The chairman of this event, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Professor Yemi Oshiba, GCUNSAN, the Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Sonwulu, the very respected Chief Oleola Nikwekun OFRSAN, and Mama, Princess Omolara Ola Nikwekun. I think on that note, I will stand on already established protocols, and I say good afternoon. Let me particularly thank the Vice President for making our time to personally chair this event. I know your close relationship with Chief Olani Pekun, but your presence here today is also indicative of your recognition that the justice sector is a potent weapon for correcting the ills of our great country. Your legacies of reform as Attorney General in the justice sector are there still enduring. I made this point when I delivered the 10th Convocation Lecture of Oshun State University in September 2021 but I make bold to reiterate that if law and its enforcement mechanisms, if we get them right in Nigeria and there is accountability, the future of Nigeria will be secured. What I'm going to share with this great audience within the next couple of minutes will be in four parts. First, I'll give a background of the topic and the focus of my presentation. Then I'll do an overview of the reforms we have had and whether we have kept or betrayed the promise of delivering justice, thought I would, I would identify the gaps in the implementation of the justice sector reforms, and then I will close with my conclusion. When I received the summons, couched in the tone of an invitation to deliver the keynote address, I saw it as a call to duty. Then when the managing partner, Bodiola Nikwekun, called me and said, we are also going to use it to commemorate the 78th birthday anniversary of a great statesman. It became all the more exciting for me. Chief Oleola Nipekun, without doubt, is a truly outstanding Nigerian. The characteristics that have defined your frame and spread your reputation over the years are carved in personal courage, hard work, determination, confidence, straight and forthright approach to issues, which Mr. Governor alluded to a few minutes back. Practical wisdom, much less grit, lucidity of thought and expression, and a love for humanity. As an intellectual powerhouse, you have put your life and soul into almost all that you have done and continue to do. You have made many marks both within and outside the legal profession and have become an inspiration to so many. You are not just a thoroughbred preeminent practitioner. You are indeed a man of outstanding eminence. You are the embodiment of the Latin maxim. Men sana incorpore sano, a sound mind in a sound body. Our prayer is that your legacy will continue to endure. Your Excellency, the Vice President, in the course of my research, I can confirm that significant part of the resources of Chief Ola Nipekun has gone into humanity. So that is what you are making a reference to in terms of his bank account. 
it has gone to humanity. In dealing with the topic of this year's summit, I asked myself, what exactly is the intent of the organizers? The first edition of this great event, which was, the, which was delivered by Professor Fidelis Udita, was on the keynote developing an institutional concept of justice in Nigeria. The vice president was at that event also, and the vice president looked at a number of things which I've identified in that paper. I asked myself, what exactly is the guidance for me in terms of the presentation that I'm going to be making here today? I recognize that in the letter that was sent to me, they made note of the fact that, yes, I served as vice chancellor of Lagos State University and were able to achieve a number of reforms. In the, in the five years of the tenure of that administration, there was no crisis for the five years. There was no break in the academic session of the university. Those who know last before will attest to that. And it was a time that the university became a World Bank Center of Excellence. So these were some of the things that were indicated in the letter, and I felt they were part of the things that they want me to make allusions to. Now I look at the area of eminent jurists, leading practitioners and scholars that have been put together to discuss the theme of this event. It is generally accepted that the essence of reforms is to focus on problems with the, way of, with the aim of rooting them out. The importance of stock taking the reforms, on the other hand, is to identify where progress has been made and where much still remains to be done with a view to improving on both the relevant rules and processes. What I've done here is to look at what have we achieved since 1999. That is the benchmark that we are taking. What have we achieved since 1999 in the area of reforms? On its part to development, the drivers of Nigeria's justice sector have not been short of vision and ideas of how to move forward to achieve incremental transformation. Like countries with trusted justice systems, Nigeria wanted a system that will expedite and make affordable access to justice, a system that will boast of swift service for all, irrespective of status, a system where the law will be administered and served by an incorruptible, honest, efficient, an intellectually sound judiciary and the bar. I have identified the thrust of the reforms in the paper. I have also identified that we are not short of champions of the agenda. If you have good reforms, if you are able to identify champions and they were able to put this in place, then what is the problem? But before we go to the problem, what has been the scorecard for us? Despite these meritorious efforts, it is undeniable that not much progress has been recorded in achieving the goals of the different reforms. Most of our work are still paper-based and have identified these problems. But it is important to mention the notes of some of those individuals who have done the assessment. When you look at what Fidelis Odita QC did at the last summit, he said, rather than just a problem of justice, uh, access to justice, what we have is a situation of exit from justice. Judges are now being regarded with disdain, while lawyers are fast becoming laughing stock or an endangered species. There is a report of the UNODC, and that report identified that the justice system in Nigeria, despite laudable reform efforts at federal and state levels, continue to face multiple challenges. Again, when you look at the index, the index of the World Justice Project, Nigeria ranks 108 out of 128 countries measured by the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index. Now, what are the gaps? I have identified nine gaps that I feel are creating the problems of justice, access to justice in Nigeria. And I stated here that I'm going to deal with them superficially so that all the other discussants will be able to flesh them up in, the, in different areas. The first one relates to administrative disconnect. In relation to administrative disconnect, I make the point that the focus of justice sector reforms has been more in putting in place right institutions, infrastructure, and rules than on administrative executives who play critical roles in the, in the field. And I made reference to one or two things. Registrars who receive applications from litigants and they don't put them in the records of the file. And cases that have suffered six, seven months adjournment will further suffer adjournment. I've made reference to situations where Schedules of court are not communicated to counsel, even though the registrars have the details of the counsel. I've made reference to the fact that adjournments at time happen simply because the records of the court are not complete and you have registrars who are dealing with them. I've made reference to the fact that appellate courts 
Council submit so many copies, 20 something copies, for five judges, seven judges. And you find out that even in the records of the file, these documents are not there. So I ask myself, these are issues relating to attitude of those who are practicing these issues. Who should do them? And I made reference to the fact that if you go to the National Industrial Court, they have a process that works very well. They have a process at the National Industrial Court where your judgment, you get them electric, electronically. Where when you have paid for service, your, your, your papers, the processes will be served without you having to stress yourself or suffer through anything. It is the mindset of the individuals who are carrying out activities out. And we need to come back to train them. In addition to training them, we must be ready to hold people accountable. And I made reference to the fact that what is wrong in having a deputy registrar process services? And if there is a default in service of process, you hold that deputy registrar responsible. When people are held responsible and when people are accountable for what they ought to do, you will find out that they will do it differently. I went ahead and the second point that I've made there, functionaries of the ecosystem of justice. Quite a number of pre uh, presentations that I've made here this afternoon recognize that justice, the justice sector, is an ecosystem involving different individuals. I've made reference in this particular area to functionaries such as correctional officers, the police and the rest of them, and I noted that they do not have the requisite training that they ought to have. In addition to that, those who are exercising prosecutorial decisions, you find a situation that people misact, and when they misact, there is no accountability. Nobody is held responsible when you take a decision that violates issues relating to plea bargaining. When you take decisions in relation to charges that should be, left, that should be, that should be uh, 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 placed before the court, at the end of the day, a man who has been who has been uh, convicted on a, of an offense, ends up getting five years for something that runs into millions, whereas a man who has stolen a goat will get seven years imprisonment. So you begin to ask yourself, where is this disconnect? Somebody has stolen billions, he's getting four years, five years, and they take it back to the time he was incarcerated, and eventually he will end up with four years. But somebody who has stolen a goat, because he's hungry, he's going to have seven years. There is clearly a disconnect within the system. I made reference to challenge of technology in Nigeria. And I noted in this paper that challenge of technology is simply because we have given a bad name to technology. When you start from procurement and you don't procure a good product, you end up getting technology that is outdated as at the time you want to use it. Why is it that in the private sector, technology is working very well, but in our court system, technology is not working well? The process that Professor Yemi Oshibaju left in 2005, how far have we gone from that process since the time we started? That is a challenge. I also made reference to mortar coils in enforcement of judgment. When you go to our court premises, you see quite a number of vehicles. You see a whole lot of things that have been done there in furtherance of execution of judgment, you begin to ask, both the judgment debtor and the judgment creditor, none of them is having justice. Because by the time those things are destroyed there, the judgment creditor is not able to have money's worth. The man who owns the thing from whom you collected it, what is he taking home? Nothing. So what is it that we are talking about justice in that situation? Then I went ahead to say that lawyers, we are responsible for perpetuating a number of inefficiencies in the justice sector. And I will make reference to, in every application for land, a lawyer will go to court and file an application for injunction. When you know that lease pendants doctrine is there, anything done, 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 done that during the period will go to nothing. Why do you have to belabor the courts with application for injunction? I have made reference to the fact that as long as the client is ready to pay, you see that our people, uh, lawyers will go to court and file any application. I've made ref and you find out that our judges at times are handicapped in meeting these challenges because at the end of the day, they are scared of frivolous petition. Because what it will take a judge to defend a frivolous petition that has been put against him is so much, he will fund the trip, fund the trip of the registrar to the, to the Supreme Court. At the end of the day, if the matter is adjourned, he will come back to Lagos. 
no judge wants to be able, uh, no judge wants any frivolous application to be written against them. And the, the end result of that is a situation where they are not in control of their court as they should be. To discipline errant counsel who are mischievous with great respect. And I made note of the fact that when you go to countries like the US and the UK, if you file an application that is frivolous or you do something that amounts to professional misconduct, the judge right there will start the sanction. It happened in the case of, in the case of uh, uh, um, the, uh, by, uh, 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 President Biden. The lawyers in, uh, uh, in Delaware who filed wrong applications, not only did the judge find them and said they should pay, for all the, uh, the, the cost of all the lawyers that were involved on behalf of the state, they said they should go back for training. And they also handed them over to disciplinary committee. Those are the kind of things that should happen. If you file a frivolous application against a judge and it is found to be frivolous, you should mandatorily face disciplinary process. These things should not be tolerated. I made a point about judicial officers and the burden of justice. And I said at the end of the day, you find out that our judicial officers, quite, some judges don't sit at 9 o'clock. When they sit at times, they don't go through the process in a way that is congenial. They give impression that there is hostility. Yes, we have recognized that lawyers can do some things that are wrong. But we have also recognized that some of our judicial officers, they don't have that judicial instinct. You must recognize the fact that some of, when you look at the training of, uh, uh, when you look at the training of, uh, lawyers, as at the time you are going through the university and going through the law school, you are not being trained to serve as a judge. You are being trained to serve as a lawyer. When you are serving as a lawyer, you are taking the position of, uh, I am protecting the interest of my client. You are not taking the position of balancing situation, looking and putting it on the scale and being able to do your assessment. But we throw them in after two weeks of sitting with another sitting judge. We say they should go and start the work. At the end of the day, giving them that judicial instinct is not going to work that way. So I've made the point in the paper. Then I said, the way we want to monitor lawyers, there's also a need to start monitoring our judges. And I made reference to the fact that sometime in the 80s, no, sometime in the, in the 80s, we had, no, it was the early 90s, we had a magazine in Lagos. It was Squib magazine. I'm sure some, other, some lawyers will remember the Squib. The fear of the squib was the beginning of seriousness. No judge will sit late because squib will report it. If a judge, if a counsel misconduct himself, squib will report it. If a registrar does something that is not right, squib will report it. But what happened to squib? Squib was shut down. It shows a system that does not want to be monitored. If we continue that way, we cannot achieve justice at the end of the day. Complexity of appellate court rules. <coughs> I made the point that when you are looking at our appellate court rules, and I made an example, the Supreme Court strikes out a man's appeal against that sentence on the ground that the notice of appeal was defective and incompetent, same having been signed by counsel to the appellant instead of the appellant himself. Because the process was signed by his counsel and not by the appellant, that is the basis upon which the appeal is found incompetent. Our courts have continued to draw a distinction between grounds of mixed law and fact, ground of fact, ground of law. And from time to time, the courts will tell us that it is a thin line between some of these issues at times. I believe we can make less complex our court of appeal rules. I believe we can make less complex. Look at these issues that creates, because when you look at our system, a matter that has been adjourned or a matter that did not come up, for about three, four years, when they say that the appeals that are being had now are appeals dating back to 2017, 2018, and they come to court in 2021, and then they are struck out for being incompetent because it's a ground of mixed law and fact, and there was no leave taken before the court. These are issues that are destructive of uh, uh, justice. Then I made the point, the last one, uh, this, the eighth one, I've run through seven of them. The eighth one, Supreme Court. I have noted that there's a need for significant shift in the way our Supreme Court are looking at issues. The goal of justice sector reforms 
is to enable the law to achieve substantial justice. Justice is the goal and the spirit of law. Consequently, there is no reason why a court should not administer justice in every situation and according to law. I've made reference to four cases here. FRL against Ojikalu. I know it's a popular case that all of us know. Lucky against the state. Ode and Alaga. Adegba and against Ojelabi. I'm only going to focus on one of them. I will focus on Ode and Alaga because the birthday, the birthday boy, Chief Olani Pekun, was in Ode and Alaga. He was for the appellant applicant. What happened in, in Ode and Alaga? The issue before the court centered on irregularity of service of the notice of appeal. Respondent did not deny receiving a copy of the notice of appeal. Respondent accepted service of appellant's application for leave to appeal at the same address. Respondent was served with the notice of appeal by substituted means based on an order of the court, and this was before the hearing of the appeal. Respondent filed an exchange briefs of argument, which in itself is a waiver or in a way of the defect. The Supreme Court held that because there was no personal service of notice of appeal, the appeal was incompetent. And I said, historically, I said, the, these cases are indicative that despite the mantra of the court not to sacrifice justice on the altar of technicalities, the Supreme Court, with very great respect to their lordship, have continued to show a rigorous adherence to inordinate legalism as against determination of cases on their merit. And I may reference historically to the Supreme Court <clears throat> in the exercise of its interpretative jurisdiction has always walked the talk of pushing mechanism in the law to the back while pushing substance over form. I made reference to the case of Ariori against Elemo, Ohuka against the state, Nasiru Belu and Attorney General. Thank you very much. You saw that my voice was cracking. Thank you. Up to 9 o'clock yesterday, I was at another place talking. <laughs> Nossi Rubello and Attorney General, these were landmark judgments where the court made clear its intent to go to any length to ensure that the ghost of the past will not stand in the path of justice, clanking their medieval chains. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, you need to read cases that were on when outside, uh, outside of jurisdiction clauses were on ground. And you need to see the bold decision of our courts to ensure that you need to do everything before you can oust their jurisdiction. They guard it jealously. Our Supreme Court can determine the shift. Our Supreme Court can change the attitude of counsel and can change the attitude in relation to justice. The Supreme Court, it's a legal challenge for justice when judicial power is solely focused on application of legal principles so the exclusion of adjudication based on policy. When the attainment of the good to be is obstructed by the preservation of the good that is, the man on the street becomes distrustful of the judicial process. The Supreme Court has a significant role to play in shaping the society, shaping history, and shaping attitude towards the judiciary and the justice sector. The apex court should never be seen or be perceived to sabotage justice or take decisions that will undermine public confidence in the judiciary, whether it is to fill in gaps left open by indeterminate law or overrule precedent or legal positions that will have the effect of citizens suffering injustice at the hands of the law, or even to rebuild counsel's unethical inclination to sabotage the law. The Supreme Court has a duty to ameliorate the simplistic rigor of the rules in the context of fact situations as they develop and bring about a cultural shift to accountability at all levels of our justice sector. And I made a point. When some school of thought come up to say that the Supreme Court, that the judiciary cannot make laws, that it is stepping into the realm of the Vice President, sir, sir I want you to listen to this, sir. When the Supreme, people argue, some school of thought say that the court cannot make law that it is just to interpret the law. And then they say that the court cannot step into the terrain of legislating. When you have a bad law, 
the Supreme Court has a duty to interpret that law. It is the spirit of justice that the Supreme Court is looking for. And when the Supreme Court does that, the Supreme Court is not going outside its remit. What the Supreme Court is doing is interpreting in the line of justice, in the line that the man in the court, the man on the street, will leave the court premises happy and satisfied that justice has been done. So it is not the case that the Supreme Court is stepping up. Finally, I went into political leadership and passive implementation of reforms. And I noted quite a number of provisions that these are reforms that we have done, particularly in relation to correctional institutions. These are reforms that we have put in place, but we have not implemented them. There are quite a number of them, and I've mentioned them there. There is no time, so I must close up. Conclusion. The burden of justice is beyond the attributes of impartiality, equity or fairness of the judge, which we most times try to generalize as justice. It extends to the multitude of state and civil society institutions in the justice sector with varied vested interest, who must equally play their roles with a clear understanding of the importance of their contributions. In implementing justice sector reforms, there were three key assumptions whose self-evident truth were concluded, we concluded were clear to all. The first is that the moment we bring in best practice, we will achieve the desired goals. The second is that all critical stakeholders have an understanding of what is at stake, and at worst, what will be required is the upscale of their skill set and knowledge. The third is that all critical stakeholders will exceed the right discipline and commitment. Day-to-day -day unfolding events have fiercely challenged these assumptions. The threat to reforms and the dividend of reforms are steeped more in our individual contributions as stakeholders. The reality confronting Nigeria at the moment is that of lack of enthusiasm for justice within the justice sector. It has outpaced holistic justice. To give legitimacy to justice, accountability for the action of every role actor within the sector is critical. Indeed, it is fundamental. In the final analysis, for as long as the justice sector fails to implement reforms that translate to real justice, the force of equity and fairness will itself incite changes in ways that are radical and beyond what we can generally anticipate. And in closing, in closing, I said this. What were the three things we did at LASU? That for these five years, 2016 to 2021, Everybody was part of the project. Everybody ran the race. Three things we did. Strict adherence to rule of law and due process. It allowed us to be consistent and fair. Even if you are close to the vice chancellor, what you are not entitled to, you will not get it. And if you are, if you are a foe of the vice chancellor, if you see yourself as a foe of the vice chancellor, whatever it is that you are entitled to, you will get it. I don't need to go there. They can be asked. They will confirm it. Two, every member of the community was made to understand the vision and they became leaders in their respective corners. That changed the culture. Three, accountability became a watchword because we were very bold on discipline. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Larry Fagbon, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. I also thank my stars that um, in the few times we've worked together that we've been on the same side because uh, it's, it certainly will be big danger for you to, to have you as an adversary. Sir. Um, we'll go straight to my very respected noble lord, Honorable Justice Kashim Zana. He would um, kick off the the panel discussions. Um, my lord is the chief judge of Bono State, sir. It's a pleasure. I always love to hear, to listen to you. My lord, you're welcome, sir. Wow. Oh. A hard act to follow. 
Your Excellency, the Vice President, may I pray that I be deemed to be in compliance with all dictates of protocol and propriety. I have noticed Justice Ariola nodding his head, and I assume there is nobody appealing against this decision. When Bode called first and intimated me of the impending invitation, I thought it was going to be again to talk about technology. He pleasantly surprised me when he said, no, it's integrity we want you to talk about, judicial integrity. I agreed when he told me particularly that this year's summit is going to be different as it's also going to be in honor of Chief Ole Palani Pekun clocking the age of 70. I will admit that no person humbles me more than that who, having legitimately, by dint of hard work and intellectual acumen, achieved a lot, yet turns round to use the fruits of his labor and acumen for public good and renders public service with it. As one who has been claiming salary every month for every, every good I may claim to have done, I cannot but be humbled. So refusing was out of the question. And it's after he got me into that that he now delivered the most difficult part. He said I was to speak for 10 minutes. I said, what? To talk about integrity for 10 minutes? So we agreed that I was to stop after 10 minutes or soon thereafter. Now, judicial integrity and technology have been my passion. Of late, it's only technology that is being seen because at a certain point, it became necessary for me to go a little bit crazy <laughs> as things were happening and the technology uptake was really appalling in the judiciary. Integrity is much more important. But the two, in my humble opinion, the question of integrity and the question of technology uptake are the two principal issues that stand out in justice sector reform or the need for reform. Because I believe integrity is not everything, but Everything else becomes nothing worthless without integrity as far as dispensation of justice is concerned. In fact, it can become dangerous. Intellectual acumen, knowledge of the law in the hands of the person who doesn't have integrity become even dangerous. It's deployed to obfuscate the bad conduct or the denial of justice that may have just taken place. So efforts have been made to entrench integrity, to imbue judges and judicial officers, and all in the justice sector indeed, with integrity. And we have courts of conduct, disciplinary mechanisms, all in an effort to show that integrity is safeguarded. Have they worked? Now, for me, it's immaterial, the argument and the debate as to whether it is just a perception, people don't understand, it's immaterial. So long as the judicial system, particularly the judiciary, is perceived as being devoid of integrity, then it's equally bad, whether it is just perception or it is true. For, as we all know here, once that confidence is not there, 
that justice is being done, it is as bad as justice actually not being done. Now, I'll tell you basically just a short story and play a short clip and end it within 10 minutes or soon thereafter. It was a nagging thing and an experience or experiences I had sitting to consider petitions really jolted me and was agitating my mind and I was distressed. Both at the national and state level sometimes in considering petitions against judges, I've come to realize that in some instances, actually, the ethics, the, co the court, the rules contained in the conduct, code of conduct are not even understood. Or how else would you explain a situation whereby a judge is accused, for example, of something that is just a minor indiscretion, and in his defense, he is admitting to a gross misconduct? Boldly sitting down saying, no, that's not what happened. This is what happened. What was alleged was probably a minor uh, indiscretion. Yet, he thinks what he is admitting himself, which is gross misconduct, is his defense. I was, it was pleasing in a twisted way of saying it to discover that that was not a peculiar problem to us in Nigeria. It's worldwide. Drafting the courts and reading them is one thing. Understanding the situations when they develop in actual life, because some of these ethical issues present themselves as dilemmas. They are not straightforward. So opportunity presented itself when I was honored to be invited to be a member of the Global Judicial Integrity Network of the UN. I went with that in mind, hoping for some solution, and recently realized that it's something that is bedeviling other nations too, issues of integrity. So it wasn't a difficult thing, getting, oh, please move on with the slides. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. I've already passed that. So there was, when the opportunity presented itself and uh, I tabled the issue, in fact, I'm, I, I, in all honesty, I'm not even sure whether I was the first person to table the issue. It was so much agreed that we needed to do something. So an expert group was formed to come up with how to teach these courts, how to make judges invite these courts. Uh, just go ahead and play the clip so that the story will be told by the clip produced after we came up with a training tool and called in willing nations to train their judges. And judges stand up, including justices of the Supreme Court, for the training. Please go ahead and play the clip. Sadly, there is corruption amongst some judiciaries in some countries in the world. One of ten complaints of breach of duty of judges or prosecutors relates to the unethical behavior. We have a serious problem with the independence. And after that, the corruption. In terms of ethics and conduct, this is a major thing nowadays globally for all of the judges around the world, which is why we're advocating for more training of judicial officers. Judges and prosecutors are not fully aware of their ethical responsibility. Subtract integrity and everything collapses as far as the positives in the judiciary are concerned. We are the ones who uphold the rule of law. And if we don't have that integrity, if we don't have that independence, then Nobody looks to us to save them at a time when their principles, their rights are being trampled on. Los magistrados, los jueces, somos seres humanos y ciudadanos como el resto. Vivimos en un ámbito con, y sufrimos los mismos inconvenientes que el resto de la sociedad. 
One of the major new challenges is social media. Issues change. Integrity issues also change. Sextortion, where a judge might make a lenient sentence in return for sexual favors. Years back, gender issues may not even be discussed when it comes to integrity, but now gender issues have become issues of integrity too. You see that this is actually something that might offend the Bangalore principle. So you now have to look inward and look at everything from your private life and not just your public life as a judicial officer. Many judges have to go outside their country and to see what other countries do. The Global Judicial Integrity Network is a network of judges, for judges and driven by judges. With this network, it's peer helping peer. You leverage these tools to improve on your understanding of the issues of integrity and also on how to cope. We consulted uh, around 4,000 judges and justice sector stakeholders to identify the priority areas uh, in judicial integrity, the needs for assistance uh, and the needs for peer learning and support. And that is how we established the network. When it comes to judges and judiciaries, honestly, they speak the same language. Part of the reason for us developing through such a powerful organization as the UNODC um, training materials is to really raise the profile of the importance of judicial training. Judicial officers tend to think because they sit alone uh, making decisions that they don't need further education, but it's something that they actually do need. It enhances them. It's not something that says you're not good enough. It's something that actually elevates you to that higher level. On the website, you can also find a specific page about the training tools, so you can access there all the information about the three tools, the e-learning course, which is comprised of three modules, and it covers all of the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct, as well as emerging challenges of judicial ethics. I found the virtual course very useful. It was eye-opening, and I love the fact that it was engaging. You know, it would have several aspects of learning. There was stuff you could read, there were videos for you to look through, and every so often it would pause to jog your memory on what they've just trained you on so that you don't, you imprint it in your memory and you remember it as you go along. So I really enjoyed it. You can find also information about the self-directed course, uh, which is the second tool for those jurisdictions that cannot have either access to the internet or have technical difficulties doing the online course. The judicial ethics training tool is one that will help you avoid trouble. Judges do not like being lectured to. 90% of the activities in our training is hands-on, the judges do it themselves, small group activities, all sorts of interesting um, ways in which we get them in involved. Think about how are you going to equip the judges that you're going to train back in your countries. Most important thing is that they train us to train in a very modern and a new way that we didn't know before. Gradually, there'll be some kind of snowball effect whereby across the world, more and more people will be trained to do this sort of work. We have more than 40 pilot sites, which means there are jurisdictions that actually wanted to embark on this journey with us. It's phenomenal. The whole point of this training is to get judges to realize that they're human and to be conscious of their frailties and to deal with them. You don't have to pitch it. It sells itself. If all the judge will apply the principles, we can make a change and uh, we can project to the people another way to see the justice system. I think it's going to be eye-opening back home for the judges that we have. It's very, very useful in their everyday life uh, on the bench. I'm very happy to have the possibility to participate in the course. I'm going to put in practice all the things that I learned in these days. So I'm really grateful to the United Nations for pushing this through and I, I know that it's going to make the world a better place. Thank you, let's go to the next slide. Now, since we left Vienna after the first training that we delivered, 
several countries. And the last time, I think it was up to 70 that have adopted it. I commend it to all judiciaries in Nigeria. And it's not just for judges. It's important that lawyers also know about these things. It's a very interesting self-directed course you take online in privacy and take the test. Three modules. You can go to the last module if you like and the advanced module. And after you take the test and pass, you get a certificate. But the pass mark is 80. It covers the wide gamut of integrity issues. The conventional or the known ones like judicial independence, but particularly of concern are exercises that have to do with how to identify ethical issues when presented, how to resolve ethical dilemmas, and also new and emerging issues in uh, judicial integrity. Uh, I, it's, sorry, my 10 minutes are, soon thereafter is about to be long thereafter. So there are emerging issues. Uh, it's not just bribery or corruption, but there are more insidious issues of integrity that judges have to confront. I'm particularly uh, delighted with our content there on implicit bias. I remember when I presented this at the previous national uh, annual uh, judges conference, and I asked how many judges approach a case when already biased. No hand was raised. But subsequently, when I, I presented it uh, at another forum, all the judges who were present at the first one, because I went in depth into implicit bias, raised their hands. Because when we talk about bias, the thought is of conscious bias. But there is subconscious bias. There is unconscious bias. And they are even more dangerous because they are more insidious. And as judges, these are issues that we need to familiarize ourselves with. I'm, I must uh, permit me to say that imagine issues go even into imagine crimes. Judges need, as a matter of integrity, to be abreast of these developments and equip themselves to handle these cases. I remember when our, as usual, our vice president, I was watching television when he cautioned about hate speech. That was virtually unheard of in this country, but it was something that we were living with and we were reaping the bad consequences of. So judiciaries need to be abreast when the laws come. Unfortunately, in Borno, we've just reviewed our law. Oh, well, we've submitted a review, uh, a request to review our penal laws. Hate speech is one of it, like uh, criminal trolling. All these are the integrity issues. The integrity is integral to be whole. So the demands are high, and these costs, these costs, takes care of a lot of it. Now, quickly, because Wale uh, Bode also talked about, if I could refer to it, the, the topic as couched here in this paper, in this and, uh, program, I, I just saw it here too, the title. But fortunately, fortunately, by coincidence, uh, I'm speaking to the topic or the title given to me. Now, in Borno, quickly, what we have done is we have already made it mandatory, not mandatory as it appears in my slide. Oh. Yes. It's not, we've already made it mandatory that you must take that online course and present your certificate before we consider you for appointment as a judge. Full stop. Your paper moves nowhere. In fact, as, and it is, uh, as soon as you're shortlisted, you're advised that, look, this is the site go and sit, and you send in your uh, second certificate to the JSC as soon as you get it. If you get it after we have sat, then that's too bad, because we don't lift your paper. The first request is, where is the certificate? We look at the certificate, then we go in to consider other things. Another thing we inform, because now this goes to efforts at entrenching uh, integrity, not in the process of appointment, because that was not what I was considering, but incidentally, it covers that one too. Now, we already have a rule in the JSC rules, uh, judicial, in fact, NJSC rules, that you should not lobby to be appointed a judge. So we have gone further. As soon as you are shortlisted, you get the letter that you are shortlisted. Go and take this integrity test and present your certificate. And also, we caught that section of the NJSC rules that says you shouldn't lobby 
and we've gone further to also add, advise your well-wishers to not to lobby on your behalf because we'll not be in a position to know whether they did it with your consent or without your consent. Now, but particularly of importance, and I'll end it there probably, is that we stick to the rules. If somebody lobbies, it takes only one condonation to make nonsense of the whole rules. So in all instances, in fact, in two instances, where there was lobbying by well-wishers, that was the end of it. And we made sure that it was known. And fortunately for us, they were not just ordinary citizens who lobbied. They were important personalities. Because, like it or not, it will be known that there was this lobbying by this or that person. So it is, important. It is not enough to make the rules. You must stick to it. And I'm glad the Vice Chancellor alluded to something like that. That is what happens in all institutions. You make the rules, you deviate only once, and that's it. They know that you are not following the rules. So it's all uh, uh, useless. And then leadership by example. Please, can we go to the next slide? It's, it's not just enough to preach. You have to also lead by... Yes, I'm done. This is my certificate. Thank you very much. Next slide. Next slide. Uh huh. So don't think I'm exiting. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, my lord. And uh, you know your your closing remarks just fit into uh, the next discussion from Mr. Femi Falano, senior advocate of Nigeria. Um, he will be speaking to us about political influences on judicial appointments. So, so it just flows um, into the next consideration. Leonard Silk, sir. Thank you. Thank you. My turn, buddy. Yes. Uh, well, um, I'm delighted. I'm specially delighted to join this celebration of my Igbo. Chief Olani Kwekwan had led me in cases. He once led me in a case involving a student leader who was expired by the University of Illinois management. He himself was a student leader at the University of Lagos. So it was in the spirit of comradeship that we took up the case. But any time we've concluded, at the end of every proceeding, Shifola Nikweko would drive me home. I mean, they would learn. He was then an learning lawyer. Now he's a Lagos-based legal practitioner. And his loving wife will prepare the normal equity food, pounded yam. Thank you very much, madam. The student, sir, is now a senior lecturer at the University of Ibadan. Shola, along Yomi. Thank you, sir. We have also been on opposing sides. And the boy is so generous that when he displays his legal knowledge, he will forget the fact that we are from the same place, you know. He won't spare me. But one painful thing about the cases we have found due together is that we always paid in Naira. I haven't been lucky. To handle those cases where my bank has been paid in dollars. Chief Olani Pepo recently addressed the question of the qualification of our judges or the qualification to become a judge in Nigeria. And he had this to say 10 years post call experience for the Court of Appeal. 15 years. The Constitution doesn't say you must be a sitting judge of the High Court. But what do we have today? 
for you to get to the Supreme Court, you must be a justice of the Court of Appeal. Legal practitioners are totally ostracized. To me, the Supreme Court should be a portfolio of those who have been on the bench, the bar, and the academics. It should be the confluence of all of them. They can come with profound knowledge and robust judgment. I'm not saying those who are there are not doing well, but we can do better. It was not like this before. Elias, Nenamani, Ajebo were practicing lawyers before their appointment to the Supreme Court bench. There are very good and brilliant judges who, in the good old days, will have been sought out and brought to the Supreme Court. What we have now is promotion rather than appointment. It's still part of the problem we have. Justice Oputa was chief judge of Imo State. Would they allow any chief judge? Who we know is brilliant to go there now? Kayode Eshaw was chief judge of your State before he went to the Supreme Court. We change things and without any justification. I'm advocating that to go to the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal, a lawyer should have put in 25 years. For the High Courts and NIC, 15 years. Vacancies should be advertised. Examinations and interviews should be conducted transparently. The secrecy surrounding the appointments of judges in Nigeria should stop. Appointments ought to be seriously considered within the ambit of the Constitution. Heads of the executive appoint cabinet members subject to the ratification of the legislature. Leaders of the legislative houses elect their leaders among themselves. It is only judges that are appointed by the heads of the executive after they have been screened by the Federal Judicial Service Commission and recommended for appointments by the National Judicial Council. Nominees for the headship of the judiciary are screened by the legislature. It is my submission that the National Judicial Council, the Federal Judicial and Service Commission, and the State Judicial Service Commissions should be reorganized and democratized to allow the judiciary to appoint judges of the lower and higher bench. And my position is that we can do this, but we have to embark on almost revolutionary measures to change what has become a problem for us. I was just informed of an ongoing process in Ekiti State, where a candidate in Ekiti State was nine years old post call when the advertisement was published. Now, by the time the interview took place, it was then said, oh, she's 10. But by the time the Applicants were asked to advertise. She was nine years. And she has been recommended. We are asked that are people who are over 20 and 25. And this is the mess that we are currently going through. If we are going to make progress, we must have a system that is transparent and not a situation where the governors would tell the chief judges, these are my candidates. And whether you like it or not, if you don't recommend them, I will not approve your own recommendation. So this requires a lot of work on the part of all of us. For instance, I'm advocating an NJC headed by a retired chief justice of Nigeria and not a sitting chief justice. Because what happens now is that our heads of court are so busy with administrative duties. In those days, 
all constitutional cases were handled by the chief judges or the next judge in rank. Today, a newly appointed judge is saddled with the responsibility to handle very serious constitutional cases. We have also all forgotten that up to the Second Republic, election petitions were handled by state high courts. Numbers one to five in the judiciary were handled election petitions. And the tribunals were headed by the chief judge of the state. So if you want to destroy your state, if you want to set the state on fire, do so. And those judgments, if you go and read the judgments of those days, they, are, they were very sound. Today, you assemble judges from different states and you pretend that, oh, we don't want any influence. You post them to distant places. And what happens? On the day of the judgment, everybody has a suitcase in his boot, in the boot of the car. As soon as the judgment is delivered, it can be a dangerous judgment. Everybody asks for the airport, for the airport. And so you have you throw the state into a serious crisis. So I'm therefore suggesting that we must go back and learn from where we came from by stopping this business. In fact, it's even illegal to remove a judge from Lagos. Post her or him to Bono State and suspend all other cases on the ground that the judge has gone for national assignment as if the other cases have nothing to do with national assignment. So we must change this attitude. The, the final point for me is our own problem. The lawyers and the judges must sit down. What type of courts do you want? If we are operating a federal system of government, it is not possible that a messenger sacked in Lagos will have to be looking for a federal court, national industrial court. And that was not the practice. So we must change the system. And the final point, and I beg our judges, particularly our heads of court, we have completely abandoned the customary courts the handle majority of cases that have to do with the poor. Uh, I used to quarrel with the uh, His Excellency the Vice President. As Attorney General of Lagos State, he embarked on major reforms which has not been beaten. No, the record has not been beaten by any Attorney General in the country. But since we also represent the poor, we used to quarrel over this. What are you doing about the customary courts? Because that is where the ordinary people patronize. The high courts are for the elite and the bourgeoisie. And that is why we must, we are just going back now. My Lord, the alternative dispute resolution that we are now embracing is our own African dispute resolution. The British colonial regime took it away from here. They took it home, fine-tuned it, and they are bringing it back. We are now pretending that it's their own system. They came with the adjudicatory system. You either win or you lose. But our own traditional jurisprudence is a give and take. Everybody must take something home. No appeals today. And we must take cognizance of what is happening, sir. Many cases are decided in the palaces of our traditional rulers. In fact, Kitty today has a palace law report because virtually all the judges, I mean the traditional rulers are educated. Some are lawyers, some are diplomats, some are professors. So their judgments now are recorded. Today, criminal cases are every criminal case, including murder. All criminal cases are now settled in police stations. We simply invite the parties in what they call interviews. Because everybody has lost confidence in our judicial system. And in the police station, the cases are settled. We must take our system very seriously and find out what happens with the majority of our people 
So that for us to have a judiciary that Chifolani Kwekun has been advocating for, we must go back to the drawing table as lawyers and judges and take our judiciary away from politicians. If the heads of the other um, heads of uh, other organs of government can choose their own cabinet and their leader, we must also have a national judicial council, state judicial commissions that we can reorganize, peopled by lawyers. This idea of, oh, we want to appoint judges. Lawyers should make comments. It's not statutory. And so many of our chief judges simply ignore the position of lawyers. I'm therefore suggesting that in the ongoing review of the Constitution, we must suggest that the NBA in each state, the NBA at the national level, should comment on the candidacy of anybody who wants to go to the bench. Uh, I'm not here, I'm not supposed to join issues with any of the speakers, more so that age is no longer on my side. I have two cases pending in the National Industrial Court against the Lasso management. When my very good friend was the vice chancellor, I never received with him. But since he has raised it here, I think it is important for us. The rule of law we are talking about must be at all times, everywhere. If a lecturer has been sacked for alleged misconduct, the university law says during the investigation, it can be represented by a legal practitioner. And I sent a lawyer, Stanley Onororo, to Lasso, go and represent these two lecturers. My lawyer was sent out. No fair hearing. And those lecturers were dismissed. The cases are pending, sir, in the National Industrial Court. Thank you very much. Leonard, Le Le I'm, sure, I'm sure Professor Fagun will have a response for you. <laughs> um, just to indicate that um, one of the panelists, uh, Mrs. Ibukun Aoshika, she really needs no introduction. She's joining us virtually um, from outside the country. She's going to speak after all the lawyers speak, so she'll probably pass judgment. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll invite Mrs. Funke Adekoya, and I, I have a peculiar relationship with Mrs. Adekoya because my, when, I was, uh, when I took the silk, I appeared before a panel, which was a dreaded panel. Um, we didn't want to go there. But, uh, oh well, some people did not want to go there. <laughs> but uh, for some of us that went there, it was part of our validation after we took the silk uh, because uh, Mrs. Adekoya's reputation is that she's as straight as a ruler. If it's not, uh, if it's not demeaning to say, uh, well, if, uh, if, if a ruler is straight enough ma, to describe how straight you are, um, thank you very much, Mr. Adekoya, please. Um, thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> I am aware that I have just 10 minutes. And so I acknowledge all the distinguished individuals who are here today to celebrate with um, Chief Wally Olani Kekun. And I also extend my greetings to him. I am so happy that he's 70 today or yesterday because my discontent with the state of the justice sector, I determined was a result of my age and that it was about time I stopped going to court because I just could not put up with the state of legal practice. So to find that there is a lawyer who is a few months, not a year, a few months older than I am and is still actively going to court encourages me to believe that my discontent has nothing to do with age. It is actually the state of the justice sector as we see it. I've been asked to speak on um, essential collaboration for successful implementation of justice sector reforms. And so I'm going to speak from the perspective of the chairman of the Justice Reform Project. The Justice Reform Project, or JRP, is a coalition of Nigerian lawyers civil society,
business executives, and the general public, who are all stakeholders in ensuring that we have a functional and efficient and an effective justice system. And the reason why JRP has such an inclusive membership is because we act on the underlying principle that the administration of justice system is a public service and that it is the confidence of the public that validates the sector and that presently the public generally have little confidence in the justice sector. My takeoff point for my contribution is something that uh, Professor Fabrum said, and I quote him in his keynote address. He said, the primary focus of our rules should shift from rules that deliver justice and work within it to those who use the system, the consumers. This will ensure that best practice in service delivery becomes embedded and entrenched in the justice system. Justice must be conceived of and rendered as service. And this was the basis for the Lord Wolf reforms in the United Kingdom, which our Vice President as Attorney General took in hand and implemented in the Lagos High Court with the 2004 High Court rules. We then had front loading, we had access to ADR, we had pre-action protocols. And many states in Nigeria followed those reforms. But have those reforms actually changed the justice sector? And I, I think the consensus is that they have not. So why have they not changed the justice sector? And why is it that the public still have no confidence or very little confidence in the justice sector? Going to court is the last resort. Your first resort is Baromiru. Your next resort may be Berekete family. After that, maybe you go to your traditional ruler or your the ecclesiastical courts. But the system of whether it is customary courts or magistrate court or high courts as currently existing in our states is usually the last recourse of whether the common man or the private individual who is not so common. And that is why people like myself, fed up with the justice sector as it currently operates, have opted for ADR, private sector dispute resolution where we get to choose who will sit on our matters in arbitration. Because we can appoint people that we think have the knowledge, have the expertise, and have the ethical background to enable us follow through on those decisions and give us the judgments we want. However, when we're dissatisfied with the judgment or the arbitration award, you then head back into the court system and go through the seven years in the high court and the four years in the court of appeal. So we must fix our justice sector. What has the justice reform project done? We have looked at essential collaboration and decided that when we're talking about collaboration, you must have people you are collaborating with. So who are the parties within the justice sector? It's the judiciary, the judges, and it is the users of the system. And the judges are not the users of the system. The judges are the implementers of the system. The users of the system are the litigants and the lawyers. One of the things that GRP has done, and I go back to what Professor Fabo mentioned, he talked about Squib. At that time, Squib magazine the fear of squib was the beginning of wisdom. Now what the JRP has done is collaborated with the Nigerian Bar Association to set up a court mentoring scheme where we will monitor the courts using an app and we'll be able to collect data on when the court sits, how long the court sit for, the attitude of the litigants, the ability to have access to court records, the speed with which decisions are made available in certified true copies, 
and that will enable us to have data that will be able to present to the judiciary and highlight areas where we think reforms are needed. But the issue still remains. Will the judiciary accept those reforms uh, or, or those positions and implement? Because we need to work together. There has to be collaboration if we are going to have the justice sector that we desire. The other thing that um, the justice reform project has done is, and I refer to my Lord the CJ's comment about the UNODC and ethics. The UNODC also has online training in ethics for lawyers. And the Justice Reform Project has partnered with the UNODC to push for this online ethics training to be made mandatory for lawyers in the law school. Don't clap, don't clap, because we haven't got a yes. We have not got a yes from the law school. We've got a response that says, oh yes, it's a very good idea. And we think we can have the law students do it during their externship. But when last we checked as JRP, there was no information that this UNODC online ethics course free had been given, the information had been given to the students and that they had been asked to take this course as part of their law school training. So these are the things that we need to work upon to ensure that the judiciary, the implementers of the justice system, listen to and accept collaboration with the users of the system, whether they are litigants or whether they are lawyers. Because at the end of the day, unless all parties work together to have a justice sector that works, it doesn't work for anybody. The Justice Reform Project has also worked with the Police Duty Solicitor Scheme. Attorneys generals in various states have listened and have tried to implement the Police Duty Solicitor Scheme to ensure that there are lawyers available at police stations. Because this is one area where we have a delay between having somebody picked up and having the person taken to court. And finally, the Justice Reform Project, and my Lord the CJ is aware of that, has been pushing for virtual online hearings to continue after COVID. All states, CJs, issued practice directions during COVID. Now that COVID is over, why are we still having to go to court almost over? Why are we still having to go to court for rulings, to move motions? Why do we have to travel long distances if it is possible for these things to take place online? And so the Justice Reform Project, we've had one, I think, with um, Edo State Government. We're now going around the states, actually showcasing a full court hearing online. We've done it in Lagos State. And either way, we've done it in Edo State to show the judges that if you want to use technology, you can do it, and you can have a whole case online. Thank you very much. Th th thank, thank you very much, Leonard. So just right on 10 minutes without an additional second. Thank you very much, man. Um, my, my Lord, Honorable Justice Galumje, Justice of the Supreme Court, retired. Um, Speaking again to the subject of integrity, my lord, um, because it's, 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 it's quite critical. Um, so my lord, will please take us through um, <clears throat> your, your, your lordship's experience um, speaking to the subject of entrenching integrity in the process. Thank of... you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Well, the protocol has been overplugged, but I want to, there are some people you cannot I pass. The Vice President, I know when he was Attorney General of Lagos, recited abracadabra. And corruption, you know, tumbled. And I know he's a friend of the judiciary. 
and I believe that uh, you will do more for judiciary. Uh, the celebrant congratulate you for having attended the biblical age of three schools and ten in a country where average lifespan is less than 50. It's not a mean achievement. His Excellency, the Governor of Lagos State, my brother, Justice Aruola, and my dear brother, Justice George Adesola Ogunta-Day. Your Excellency, you're welcome. Well, integrity is the ability, integrity of a judge is the ability of a judge to resist corruption. And we know the danger inherent in corruption. Corruption as it is, we say it's a social danger because it feeds organized crimes, destroys nation states, and imper imperils opportunities. And indeed, when we talk about corruption, a nation can very well, okay, a corruption in judiciary, a nation can very well create a judiciary free of corruption. If not free, corruption can be reduced to the barest minimum. And I've heard the people's lawyer, Palana, senior advocate of Nigeria, and he has actually said so many of the things I was going to say, that as many judges as would want to be transparent, incorruptible, there are so many roadblocks that are laid on the ways of these judges. And so many are not able to cross. But so many of us in my 40, over 40 years of service in judiciary, I've encountered so many roadblocks, but I have been able to scale them. Not many will be able to scale them. And I, I, when I was at the high court, there was this uh, governor who wanted to remove a speaker. He could not muster two-third majority of the House of Assembly. So he connived with some members of the House and they rose and said they had suspended the speaker and his deputy. The speaker and his deputy came to court and the case was assigned to me. Well, I was on the verge of hearing the case. The same chief judge that assigned the case to me came to me and told me that the governor wanted me to leave the matter as it was and that if I do, he was going to do everything for me. I said, do everything for me? He said, yes. I asked him whether he, is a, he was a politician. He said he was not. And I told him I wasn't a politician either. And that if this matter was not going to be treated legally, he should take his, his file and assign the case to another person. He said, no, that I should handle the case if it takes the file away, people will talk. After hearing the parties, the governor's men were wrong and are so declared. So, immediately I delivered my judgment, a message came from the government house, they wanted to see the CJ. The CJ quickly ran to the government house. He came back and told me that he had told them to be patient and that I should stay my judgment and allow them to go on appeal to Joss and that the matter would be discussed there. I told him, I said, but you are the CJ. He said, he has told me, please, I should do that. I said, you know, my judgment are declaratory. My orders are declaratory. I cannot stay there. He insisted. And when the application was brought, I refused the application because 
I couldn't stay declaratory judgment. Thereafter, new cars were brought to the court. The governor sent along the judges that were to take these cars, and my name was missing. <laughs> and I was number two in the high court. So the city called me and said that the governor said I would not get a car. I told him there was no problem. So the cars were distributed. But thereafter, the papers and the magazine went to town were praising my judgment. Then later, the CJ called me and said, look, what you have done is the correct thing. Although the governor has refused to give you a car, I have 300,000 Naira reserve. Go and service your old car. And I said, okay, do it for me. Now, I have narrated this story to show that the roadblocks to the integrity of judiciary are created by elected politicians. <clears throat> the politicians would not like us, would not like to let judiciary go, and that their cases must be won by all means. And I have always said, I looked at the procedure that is adopted by the Central and Eastern Europe. They have created an organ that is called Council uh, Superior the Magistrature. That is Ca Superior Council of Judiciary. And this Superior Council of Judiciary, members of that body, is equivalent to our National Judicial Council. Members of that body are elected by the judicial members themselves. And they, in turn, elect whoever is going to be head of court. And if they have moved away and they want what is called judicial self-government, and judicial self-government is the only way that can lead, because without independence of judiciary, all that we are talking about training and whatever, it's not going to work. And that if a head of court is not appointed by the governor, or by the president or the governor, surely, if it's appointed by the judiciary, I believe that independence will lead to the integrity of the judiciary. Most heads of court are very careful in the way they assign cases that involve elected politicians. And they have done so in several occasions. There was this case of a popular case of Wamako, the celebrant is aware of that case. Wamako was a candidate of AMPP and PDP, and he contested under two platforms, two political platforms. Now, the, his opponent went to court, and the, um, the case came up to the Court of Appeal. At the Court of Appeal, he was a judge not qualified to have contested the election. And the election was nullified. If a, judge, if a candidate was not qualified to contest the election, yet there was an order that the candidate should contest for a fresh election that was ordered, that he should contest along with those who are qualified. I saw this as an act to please the government of the day. And this case dragged on, and it led to the expulsion of a, the president of a court of appeal, who was just doing his duty. Because the, the appeal, although the candidate went and contested and won again, opponents still went to court and said he was not qualified. And the appeal was their lying. When my Lord Justice Salami was appointed as the president of the court, and when he got there, he saw this case there. He assigned a panel to hear this case. Some lawyers came around and said, why did you appoint a panel to hear this case? Don't you know that that case was not to be heard? Because they were keeping the case, waiting for a pre-election matter that was going on at the Federal High Court, which had no time frame. Justice Salami said, I had appointed a panel and that this panel 
will hear this appeal. If you don't want the appeal to be heard, go before the panel and file your application there. All sorts of pressures were brought to bear upon him, which he refused to bow. And because he refused to bow, they sent police after him and they chased him out of the office. And those of us who were salami boys were subjected to mass transfer, massive transfers. I was transferred severally. Every year I was going to, I was transferred. I was transferred in every, I went to Port Harcourt one year, Ilorin one year, Ikiti five months, Sokoto, and all these transfers because I did not bow. Now, this is a situation which calls for sober reflection. Can we, I think what is happening in Central and Eastern Europe is because of the experience they had before the World War that fascist regimes were using judiciary against those they did not like. And they used the judiciary to oppress them. And later when presently the elected politicians said they are going to distance themselves from judiciary. And that's what it is that has given rise to self-government in judiciary. But in Nigeria and other Commonwealth countries, heads of court, Judicial officers are still appointed by the executive. Whereas the legislature appoints its own speaker, president of the Senate, and what have you, and have the power to remove them. But why do we insist that judiciary must be attached to the executive and the legislature? This is the basis upon which judicial integrity will continue to elude this country and will continue to stay away from it. I believe that if we have a critical look, we must bring to bear the model that is practiced in Central and Eastern Europe. Rest my case. Thank you very much, my noble lord. I'm sure with the various transfers, my, my, my lord will be... Um, will be multilingual now, sir. <laughs> well, uh, in fact, the, the funny part of it, even when I went to the Supreme Court, I still had problem after me because I could not conform. When I retired, it was a total lockdown, pandemic. And there was no ceremony for me. I applied that the court session for me should be monetized and that um, all the parting gifts that are given to judges should be given to me. They say financial regulation does not provide for that. <laughs> so since I retired from the Supreme Court, even a pin has not been given to me as a parting gift. And that is leading up to that. So apart from the external pressure, you have the internal pressure within the judiciary. For those heads of court who would like to please the appointing authority, and this is the situation in the country. Thank you very much, my lord. Um, we're taking the last uh, speaker before Mrs. Aoshika passes her judgment. Um, Mr. President, sir. Mr. Ebi Mahmoud SN, very, very, very critical issue um, that he will speak to diversity, gender inclusion, and merit um, in judicial appointments. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you, Bode, and uh, good evening, Your Excellency, the Vice President, uh, His Excellency, the Governor. May I also recognize the representative of the Chief Justice? And one more recognition. Um, the first lady of the bar, I always don't want to miss her. Very highly committed to the affairs of the profession. Chief Ola Kesholanke, SAN. Um, to the celebrants, um, let me say how delighted I am to be here. Uh, to, I think I can also call you my Egbon, just like the Vice President has said, and like the Governor of Lagos. 
I think you are truly my born. I remember all the uh, shared friendship in the course of the um, the work we have done together in a uh, number of occasions, and your leadership, of course, of the Nigerian Bar Association. I remember when I was elected president and um, my opponent who lost the election refused to give in. You played a very critical role in trying to rein him in and sat endlessly with us to try to resolve matters. Um, so congratulations, Chief Ole. I think this is a very well-deserved celebration. And uh, there's no better way to do this than to have a conversation around some of the burning issues of our profession. I've been asked to speak on what Bode called value-based merits uh, that will ensure meritorious appointments of judicial officers while adequately managing the complex peculiarities of Nigerian diversity. Now, so what I intend to do in the course of the next few minutes is just to speak to a number of uh, points, um, bearing in mind that this subject is one of exceeding complexity. And the first point really is to understand and appreciate how dysfunctional our judicial and legal system have become. And listening to all the array of speakers, you will understand the various uh, multidimensional nature of this problem, and also, of course, um, the Herculean task that would be needed to really um, engineer some reforms. So my comments would be around, first, diversity, around merit. Um, I would also like to speak briefly to some of the institutional issues, especially around the points about NGC and the Federal Judicial Service Commission, uh, the responsibility of heads of courts, which I think uh, Justice Nalingi alluded to. Um, I also want to comment on something which has become a norm in, the, uh, in, in our judicial appointment and promotion and all of that, and that is the CABRAC rule, by which appointments and promotions to various positions just becomes a matter of you know, automatic succession. Um, if I have a little bit of time, I'll comment on one or two issues the lead presenter, Professor Fabian Kulk, has uh, commented on. But first to the issue of diversity. Now, so uh, diversity in judicial appointments, of course, as we all know, is, uh, is very important, especially in a complex country like ours. And uh, obviously, um, in some respect, we have achieved a lot of uh, progress. If we look at gender diversity, for instance, uh, most of our courts, at least at the federal level, we have achieved nearly 30% of uh, gender representation, of female gender representation. I think in the Court of Appeal, it's a little more than 30%. Uh, at the Supreme Court, it's still quite low. Uh, having 17 justices, I think, with only uh, male justices, with only four female justices at the moment. So uh, we still have some way to go. But for me, the point of concern is the failure of the judiciary to recognize the feminine gender is feminine gender. So women, are, we still call them, uh, what do you call them, Mr. Justice. My wife detests that idea of calling her Mr. Justice Mahmoud. You know, uh, but the women themselves are the ones who prefer sometimes to be called Mr. Justice. Now, for me, there is a fundamental policy issue here. When we do not recognize the presence of gender, in our legal system and in our profession. So if you notice, I don't know how many of you have observed, especially in the appellate system, women judges, or in fact all judges, their names are um, represented in initials. Only the surname is written. So my wife will be Mr. Justice P.A. Mahmoud. You know, masking completely her identity. Now, that is, for me, a fundamental issue. You, when you decide you don't want to recognize the presence of gender, even though there is female representation, I think there is a fundamental problem in inability to recognize the presence of women 
in the profession and in particular positions and to try to understand why they are there, in fact, to bring a perspective that would otherwise be lost. So I think we, we have still a lot of work to do there. So uh, is, more, is uh, beyond tokenism, uh, Femi Falana, uh, is, is a deliberate policy to mask the presence of women in a male-dominated environment, which I don't think is, is appropriate. Um, now, nevertheless, we have to admit that some progress has been made. Uh, we've had uh, female judges heading various divisions of the court, being chief judges, and so on and so forth. Now, let me come to the question of merit. Now, sometimes a discussion of merit tends to be a little bit tricky because of the way we uh, define merit and in the way we uh, sort of uh, construct the, the criteria. Now, I've, I think Femi has alluded to this, or it, it just is also. The only qualification we have in our constitution regarding appointment of judges is the number of years post call. Now, I don't think that is sufficient. I think we need to go beyond that. The various appointing authorities need to really define the criteria much in a much more granular manner and to allow for that criteria to be independently administered, to allow for uh, merit to be promoted within the, uh, and, uh, within the system. And here issues of integrity comes in and issue of other forms of diversities. Now, as it is, the system only accommodates persons from the traditional background. And what are these traditional background? People who have courtroom experience. There's absolutely no reason why academics or other lawyers, <coughs> barristers who don't have courtroom or solicitors who don't have courtroom experience, cannot be admitted into the into the, uh, to the to the bench. Now, so, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the battle the Nigerian Bar Association has been waging to allow for advocates to come to the Court of Appeal bench and come uh, to the Supreme Court bench. And that has consistently been resisted by the, um, you know, the, uh, the system. Now, if we have a system that only allows for this sort of methodology of appointment that defines criteria very narrowly and refuses to recognize uh, that other fields of diversity or competency should be brought in, I think we are on the path to really start to find that system. In, 19, uh, in 2018, when we had the Bar Association Conference, one of the things we tried to do in order to encourage this conversation, we brought in the president of Ghana. At that very month or two months before the, the conference, he had appointed four new justices to the Supreme Court of Ghana. Two of them were the, from the private bar, and two were from the, uh, official, I mean, from the Court of Appeal. And we got him to speak to that. You know that to sensitize our, you know, uh, leaders and uh, judicial personnel to this sort of, uh, you know, merit in, in this sort of appointment. But unfortunately, all of these efforts, uh, you know, have uh, consistently fallen on deaf ears. Now, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and I hope that uh, at the appropriate time, these issues will be, uh, will be addressed. Now, let me speak a little bit on the issue of the National Judicial Council and the Federal Judicial Service Commission. I think part of the problem we have is that the judiciary has become very insular. And there's no where this is demonstrated than in these very critical institutions. You have called for democratization of the, of the institution. Now let me give an example. The Chief Justice of Nigeria presides over the Federal Judicial Service Commission, along with the uh, President of the Court of Appeal and along with, I think, the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court. The Bar Association has two representatives. The NJC is presided again by the Chief Justice of Nigeria. He has all the heads of courts along with him. The President of the Court of Appeal, the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, the President of the National Industrial Court, some Chief Justices of various states. Now, all of these people uh, persons, officials who have official relationship with the Chief Justice. And I doubt very much if any of them will be able to stand up and hold contrary views to the Chief Justice. 
Of course, we have the representative of the Bar Association. And there's a long story about the Bar Association representation, but as you know, the Bar Association representation is very ineffective. First, we don't have full mandates. We are not full members of the NGC. Our tenure is structured in such a way that we are really rendered almost perfunctory. Now, let me give an example. There was a day we were having a meeting of the NGC. We normally start our meetings at 10 o'clock. We came in, most of us, quarter to 10. We sat there until almost 12.30. The chairman hadn't come in. Now, uh, this is not usual. Uh, he normally comes in on time. But this particular time, he came in 12.30. And as soon as he came in, he started the meeting almost routinely. No apologies, no explanation for the delay. And nobody was willing to raise any issue. So I pressed the button and said, uh, put up. I said, but here waiting for the ship. And you came in, and there was no explanation as to why this meeting was being held at 12.30. There was no apology. And then he said, oh, I'm very sorry. Um, I thought the secretary of the NGC had explained the reason for my absence. Now, the point I'm making here is that none of his colleagues will be able to challenge him. Now, I was conscious of representing the bar. And even though I know it was at a very uncomfortable point to raise, but I had a duty to raise it as a member of the bar. Now, if you look at the nature of appointments into the judiciary, the FJC plays a key role, comes to the NJC. They're all basically the same personnel. Now, how then do you want um, external views, external opinions, external understanding of what needs to be done. So I think there is a fundamental need to not only reform the NGC and the um, FGC, to introduce diversity, as you call, I mean, uh, democracy, as you call it, but also user perspective, as uh, Funke alluded to, and uh, some accountability into the whole process. Now, the other point I want to make, which I think is important, is that my lord, uh, in his comment, had said um, we need self-government in the judiciary. I agree with him, but even without self-government, I don't see any reason why chief judges of states, heads of co federal courts, and even the chief justice of Nigeria should not have a tenured appointment. There's no reason why one person should be chief judge of a state for 20 years. I think you need to democratize that system. Let him be accountable to his colleagues and let his colleagues be able to have a say in what happens. Now we appoint chief judges. They are there, they sit there for 10 years, 20 years. We appoint presidents of the Court of Appeal or chief judges uh, uh, of the, and they have an untainted appointment and they now become uh, monarchs in their domain. I don't think that's what we need. We need a system that is accountable to their colleagues, where heads of court should be accountable to their colleagues, and should feel responsible towards them. There are many things which we cannot say here openly because we don't want to embarrass anybody, but I think the, many point, the minimum point that we can make is to call for accountability and systems of checks and balances. Because the problems are not just the executive branch of government, but also the internal accountability of the, of the, of the personnel. And I think all measures need to be taken to encourage accountability and transparency within the system and to um, also, of course, to call the politicians to order. I think the big, the big elephant they say is the politicians. And uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean any, um, any harm here. Uh, when we say politicians, we don't mean everybody. Uh, Your Excellency, you have been a very strong pillar of the legal profession. And I like the fact that you have sat here to to listen to the conversation here. And I'm sure that uh, when you have higher opportunity to do something, you'll be able to do something about it. So uh, just to close uh, on the one or two points which uh, the list speaker has uh, 
uh, alluded to in his presentation, and that is one about administrative um, dissonance or disconnect, you call it. I think we have to admit that the administration of the courts need not rest in the hands of judicial officers. Administration of the courts should be a specialized discipline in itself. The courts for specialized expertise. The mere fact that you've been to law school, you are a, um, a lawyer, doesn't make you an expert in judicial administration. Court administration ought to be in the hands of experts, specially trained for that. And I think this is very important, a fundamental point in order to guarantee uh, administrative efficiencies and administrative, uh, you know, uh, excellence in the system. The other point you made about information technology. Information technology is now the key driver in most institutional transformations. We cannot have information technology policy in the courts and efforts to implement information technology policies being run by non-information technology experts. I don't know how many courts have IT departments, dedicated IT departments, with qualified IT professionals, with a clear strategy for implementing IT programs. I like the point you made about uh, the impact of COVID and the fact that we should look forward to administration of justice that leverages technology. But we cannot do that on the basis of present institutional arrangements. We have to put it in place systems that bring about efficient and strategic implementation of IT infrastructure in our judiciary. And that is one way to improve not just the administration, but also the accountability of the system. So I know I'm run out of time, but I want to just uh, round up by thanking the organizers. I know the Vice President is uh, trying to uh, make his way out, but I'd like to thank him for sitting to listen to us. Thank you and much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if Ms. Okay. So we'll, we'll take the final comments from Mrs. Aoshika. Can, can we have Mrs. Aoshika, please? Um, is she still with us? Yes, she is. Um, they're going to put her on the big screen now. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so while we wait for that to load, ladies and gentlemen, those of you also viewing live, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, you are in the middle of a panel discussion, and uh, we have uh, we've had quite an insightful contribution from our panelists as well. Okay, uh, thank you, Mrs. Awashika, for joining us. So, uh, she. Please let's um, take Ms. Saushika's views from the perspective of um, a, a court user and uh, a, a, business, a, a, a business owner. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much, Wade. Uh, can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, yes we can, loud and clear. Oh. All right. So, um, I see that the uh, Vice President is already on his way out, so, but I acknowledge and respect His Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and I acknowledge the Governor of Labor State and many dignitaries who are in the house. And most especially, I'd like to congratulate uh, Mr. Olaf Valente on his 70th birthday and for the evidence of his legacy, which he can, as my father used to say, He's lived his life, see what his life after would look like, because he could see his children and his life and be so happy to die when he died and was described. So I can say to you, it's obvious to you 
what life after you do because of the legacy that you have uh, built. You are, your children have already taken the reins from you and are working with you to extend that legacy beyond uh, that which is in your life. Vice President said one of the best things to anyone of us is that in our life, we get to see the value and the impact of the work. And we are celebrated. We're not just doing it in your center again. So I congratulate you for your legacy. And I hope that as many of us as are way younger than you would, you will create big systems because the Bible says the glory of the Lord shall be a big performance. It's only biblical, not mind what you've done. And your children will be great. Amen. Okay. Uh, as the only in the panel, since all the lawyers are the rest of us don't know anything, you know, it's um, interesting to listen to all the different perspectives. And um, while the judicial system always gave me a headache before now, maybe I should have received some comfort from listening to all the presentations by the uh, many amazing people from the legal profession who have this contribution. But it's left me with a lot of than answers because at the end of the day, I haven't taken all the conclusions from different perspectives. And I, I, I put my hands together to speak. And we did an amazing job, an honest job of raising the issue. I must say to all my colleagues now that you have been as open and as open as you can be with the issues around our judicial system. But for me, as a user of the legal system, and one who, on a few occasions, uh, some of the worst side uh, of it in terms of how it's used, or how it cannot be used simply because it doesn't meet the what, what it's um, one of the things that I find um, most apt was what the uh, Professor Larry Fargo said about. A lot of people exit from you know, and what do we exit from justice simply because we look at the system, we know without the that the system is not going to deliver to you what you need because it is compromised either by structure or by the individuals within the system. If we look at this as all the contribution and we put it in crisis, it tells me that corruption is at the heart of social and it has its own negative. Does not give me the confidence and the assurance to engage the judicial system, expecting to get um, the answer that I, when I need it, as I should have it. You know, there's no guarantee that what I get is what is right to get and is fair and equitable within the uh, law itself. There is a major state of the system of many of the operators with the system running from the highest level all the way up. Of the court or the list of the judicial system. And so we have a human problem where uh, the judicial system is concerned. not just uh, the problem of the judicial system, if we have a failure of our value system as a people, you know, I mean, it's great that we've seen that we're not the only nation, but well, this is my country. This is where our uh, service of justice uh, fails me many times. In multiple ways. And as a business person, when you think in terms of what am I seeking, where is my place to be friend? What is the recourse that I have when I have issues? The system that I do not from the beginning trust. Hello. And therefore, the person has the capacity for the network of connection of money to influence the system to get position to get uh, justice in rather than me actually getting justice. I'll give you an example of the situation we went through of research. Uh, in the course of all these affairs, you know, I had to sit uh, in a conference call with about five lawyers from one of the biggest law firms in the world. And because I was, uh, because of my service to the part of a global company, that was in the process. And as the matter of FDS came up, they had the responsibility 
to speak to me or on behalf of that people in order to confirm a certain matter. They have done their own, so they had uh, some information. And when they came to me and asked me other questions, I answered all the questions uh, the best I knew and knew to the truth that it was. You know, and what I found interesting, which is sad for us as people, that needs as many people to believe in our judicial system in order to be able to invest in our future. That, there were five lawyers on the court. One person was a compliance officer, and there were four transaction lawyers. The other four transaction lawyers were encountered in Nigeria. The um, compliance lawyer had, and he was the one who had the most understanding of our system and its failings. And as all the different questions were coming, and, uh, I explained truth as I knew it, you know. At the end of the day, one of them asked me, you know, so you're just going to leave this or you're not, you're not going to act or react to this. Honestly, I thought about it and I said to you, and I said, the answer I could give and was the only thing in the team I said to her. If I was a and I have this situation, I will be caught the next one. And I will be very sure what the result will be because the need I said, but it's a little more when it comes to my country. Things are not as forward as they do. And they don't necessarily work. Because at that time, the court system will work for many months. And there's no guarantee as to when the court system will work uh, and the likelihood of justice as you were playing with people who had big stakes and had reasons uh, to work differently. And the guy who was in charge of compliance then answered his colleague and said, look, let me explain to you. I have done work into Nigeria on behalf of two major oil companies. And I can tell you that there is hardly any way where you can trust the judicial system in Nigeria to get the results that you, you desire. And he explained it that first you go from courts, they keep postponing and postponing and postponing. And at a stage, they're going to tell you that you're in the wrong court. And when you get to the court that's supposed to be the right court for you, they will tell you that your statute of limitation has expired. And therefore, you had no more time to be able uh, to take on the case. And this is after many years of being in the system. And he concluded that, look, we checked all the facts ourselves, so we know the fact, and therefore, we know what to do. And uh, that was the end of the case. And I continued with my role and my participation with that project from an international perspective. But the reality is, as of today, as a business person in Nigeria, I cannot trust the legal system. And everything you said today has not given me greater comfort. And even worse still is that if I talk about the Supreme Court judge who just retired and who is not even sure he'll get his benefits simply because he was a right thinking, uh, courageous person, then he tells me the more why many more people will not have the courage to do it. Because even he said something, roadblocks are created by politicians. But those roadblocks, in my words, can be removed by the courage and integrity of the judges who swore an oath to do so. We have a national problem. And for the judicial system to work and work for the ordinary citizen, and it must work for the highest of us as it must work for the least of us. Every single one of us must be able to trust it to serve us. We must not be afraid to engage the system. I mean, what's the point of going to court if you're going to take 30, 40 years? You'll probably be dead in the system. And what's the point of engaging the system if at the end of the day, you know, I'll tell you one story to wrap up. This 10 minutes thing is really challenging. I sat in a meeting once, serving uh, at the highest level in an organization, and an individual had the courage without any shame or embarrassment to say that he was sure of the justice he was going to get from the legal system for a particular matter. And I asked him, are you God or are you the judge? How can you decide that this is what you want to do and you're going to get this when in fact you know that that's not something you should be doing? 
And he said, oh, the matter has already been settled. And I dared to ask, settled how? And he said, oh, the judge has been seen. The uh, officers of the law that will present the case, uh, the officers of uh, the system that will present the case have already been seen, that I know the result. I mean, it was the most amazing thing for anybody to, to declare. And I was in total shock. The reality is, in that first run, that case failed. That guy did not achieve what he set out to. But later, the same matter went through our system. And the guy got what he wanted. Even though it was clear, it should never have been. So how do I, as an ordinary citizen, as a business person, confidently go to a system that I know that it can be tweaked? It can be used against you by powers, by money, and by other people whose agenda is served in multiple ways. And who is the real protector of our legal system? Nigerian Bar Association? Because there are many stories that come out of there. A lot of the issues, as we discussed today, the problem comes from lawyers themselves in many ways. And I have many stories to back that up. Judges, all judges are first and foremost. All the judges, as are today in Nigeria, are first and foremost, they are lawyers. So they are part of the system. And the attorney generals, the these, the that, the whole process is run by lawyers. But who is actually responsible for protecting the system to make sure it works and it serves us? I don't know. And all the conversations today has not answered that. We've moved it around, but we haven't locked in on who is going to take the actions that we're talking about with a sense of commitment and total responsibility that requires accountability at every level that gives me as an individual citizen of the country the confidence to take on the matter, knowing that I will get justice within the system. I'm not just the only one asking you this question. I bet every single Nigerian, whether in business, in social life, or at any stage of their life, has a question to ask. Because as, at, as we are right now, we don't trust the system. And we leave it with you guys who have the power and the privilege and the position to ensure that we can. Because all we can do is use our voters' card to vote and see if those who have the power use it in the interest of the rest of the citizen to make things work better for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, <laughs> very respected Mrs. Sibukun Aoshika. Uh, I, I, I don't have those powers. We probably would have given you an honorary degree in law so that you join us to answer those questions. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, Oscar, please, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we move on very quickly to um, a goodwill message uh, from the uh, matriarch of the Nigerian Bar, uh, Chief Ola Keshe C-O-N, S-A-N. Please do make welcome with a round of applause. We'll also have, after that, brief remarks by the true celebrant, uh, for the day, and of course, the cutting of the cake. A round of applause once again. How are you, ma'am? Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I thank the organizers. I just please forgive me if I don't have any protocol to offer. The organizers very fortunately gave me five minutes, and my learned friend of the silk, the celebrant of the day, has specifically appealed to me to keep it to five minutes, and I want to do that. But just when I start, then the five minutes can start. This is just protocol. I salute everyone. I congratulate the celebrant of today, my learned friend of the silk, Chief Wale Olani Pwekun, I say to you, dear Natalis Felix, happy birthday. I salute your beautiful wife, Lara. I love you. Congratulations to you. And please, I salute everyone here present. 
And I just would like to say that I'm very happy that Justice Galunye is here. Even without being compensated by the Supreme Court, you've been able to attend. My learned friend of the silk deserves every singular accolade according to him as he rejoices over his seven decades of staggering achievement, both in life and in law. Why do I say so? I illustrate five compelling attributes in my allocated five minutes. One, my learned son is a good, is a God-fearing Christian. I do not say so because he, re he res 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 recently built and donated a gigantic and majestic cathedral to his Ikere, 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 Ikere. Christian community, and not because he was wearing a fabulous gold chain with a cross on his head in his photograph, but because his lifestyle reflects Christian attributes. He loves his neighbor as himself. Two, the latter son is a very caring husband, parent, and grandparent. I mentioned husband first because legitimately one becomes a husband before becoming a, fa a parent. He is dedicated to the welfare of his family and extended family. About a year ago, a relative he had trained and nurtured died prematurely while he was traumatized by this bereavement. Three, the learned son's patriotism. He is so concerned about our current turbulent times and has advocated for a new constitution altogether to replace the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria under which, we, under which we pretend to have a federal system of government when in fact we have a unitary system of government. Four, the learned son's passion for the one and only learned profession he is passionate about the profession. He encourages the youth and helps them to succeed Indeed, he has sponsored many law students in the law school over the years, even though some of them never remember the benefactors. I have also experienced such ingratitude. He currently has a scholarship project for the school children in his hometown. He loves the law so much that two of his sons are now senior advocates of Nigeria. The presence of the prodig prodigious array of the legal shining stars in the legal firmament in Nigeria here present and participating in this intellectual discourse is testament to the huge respect and affection which the son enjoys in the learned profession. I salute the erudite panelists for your illuminating contributions to this discourse and I thank my learned friend Mahood for his recognition of me. The learned son always values five, my fifth attribute. The learned son always values merit and aspires to reach utopia in all he does. He pursues merit and repudiates mediocrity as a genuine, a genuine, emphasis on genuine, as a genuine senior advocate of Nigeria, he's very anxious that the integrity and dignity of the prestigious rank be maintained. He was so frustrated recently that he told me he was going to retire. I told him he must, he must not retire, but he must remain intellectually engaged so that the atrophy of the body does not set in. A lawyer never retires. I am here at 89. Thank God.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. His passion for the rule of law motivates him to arrange this colloquium on the crucial appointment of judges. Now, I've given the five attributes. I dare anyone to, uh, to challenge the accuracy of my testimony. In peroration, I'm delighted to celebrate the family. Whenever I write to them, I sign, quote, great grandma, grandma, mom, auntie. Great grandma, because of Tireni Olua, the beautiful, precious little daughter of Dagbo and Oyinda Mola. Grandma, because of Dagbo and his siblings. Mom, because of Lara, the charming wife of Wale. And auntie, because of Wale, who thinks that a difference of about 20 years in age is not sufficient for me to qualify as mom. <laughs> Before I end, let me thank Mahmoud for his gender equality crusade. Thank you, Mahmoud. To the celebrant, Chief Wale Olani and many happy returns. Ad Anus Multus. May you continue to enjoy the abundance of divine benevolence. Deo Wolete. And Funke, well done. Falano, well done. Everybody, Falano. Oh, the, the Chief Judge, please forgive me. I'm rushing. I salute everyone individually. Thank you so much. I thank you all for your attention. I've had to speak very, very old. Justice Ariwola, I beg of you. Thank you very much. I, I, I had to speak very fast because my learned friend of the sick, Wale, come, came to me and just reminded me of my five minutes. And I thought I must abide by your instruction. It's your day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we can do much better than that. The first female senior advocate of Nigeria and the first female senior counsel. And I might add that she looks drop dead gorgeous. If you agree with me, all in favor say aye. And the eyes have it. Thank you so much, Ma, for that heartwarming remark. And of course, we are eternally grateful for the Amazon of a woman that you are. Thank you.